I want to talk about being unreasonable because I believe it's okay to be unreasonable. In fact, I think it's necessary to solve some of our most difficult problems. Several years ago, George Bernard Shaw told us that all progress comes from unreasonable people because reasonable people adjust to their surroundings, unreasonable people rebel against their surroundings, and they produce progress. Now, I have been in business for the last 40 years and have been very fortunate to be a part of building a successful company here in Jacksonville. It's been a great journey, and I can honestly say that I have had the opportunity to live the American dream. But so many people today don't have a shot at the American dream, and that troubles me. The American dream used to be about hard work. Today, it takes hard work and a good education. 70% of the jobs that are being created today require at least two years of college or significant technology training. The middle class has been shrinking for almost 50 years. In 1970, 61% of the population was in the middle class. It's now at about 47%. That's not good for our people, and that's not good for America. The hardest hit, those with a high school degree only and high school dropouts. Education is so important. Education impacts just about every aspect of our lives. It's directly linked to employment, how much money we earn, whether or not we can afford to buy a home, our long-term financial stability, our health, our mental health, and certainly crime. Education affects the well-being of neighborhoods, communities, cities, and ultimately our country. So 10 years ago, my wife and I and our two children decided to act and get involved in the education reform movement. So we formed a family foundation solely dedicated to improving public education. We have been involved in countless initiatives over the last 10 years. One of the first initiatives that we got involved with with other community leaders was to recruit and bring Teach for America to our city. And shortly after that, we were awarded the opportunity to open up a KIPP school, K-I-P-P, -P, Knowledge is Power. It's a college preparatory charter school that serves the underserved community. We have almost 1,000 students in our school, and we have 1,400 on our waiting list. And then six years ago, I was asked to go on the State Board of Education. I actually served for two years as chair. And I'm proud of a lot of the accomplishments that we've made at the State Board to further enhance and increase the standards for our children. So this collective experience and many more have convinced me of a couple of things. First, this work is really hard. And second, it takes a lot of unreasonable people to break down barriers and, and transform the system. Now, education needs to be relevant. Education needs to keep pace with an ever-changing world. There's a technological revolution going on. One of the ways, one of the opportunities that I think we still have in education today is to infuse 21st century skills into our curriculum. Take computer science, for example, which I believe is a new form of currency. Well, currency, we think about currency being money, where we take money and we actually exchange it for goods and services. 
And what I'm talking about is learning computer science skills so that you can exchange those skills for a chance at the middle class and the great American dream. In three and a half years, in 2020, there will be one million computer science jobs unfilled by American workers. If you're wondering what those jobs are, I would ask you to go to Google and type in the top 50 computer science jobs. It's everything from a web developer to a programmer to a software engineer. And when we look at computer science as a subset of the greater STEM world, science, technology, engineering, and math, as we look at the last 10 years, we see that jobs in those areas have grown three times faster than all other jobs. And STEM jobs are projected to grow at 17% for the next 10 years, actually 19% in Florida. Half of the jobs only require a two-year degree. And here's the most alarming fact. Only 2%, only 2% of the current computer science workforce are people of color and female. These are two very large demographic groups that are not participating in this new economy and this new currency. So we must act, and we must act with a sense of urgency. Now let's take a look at the disparity between girls and boys. When we talk to girls and boys in high school and we ask them, is a career in computers a good choice for you? 47%, almost half of the girls say it's a bad choice. Only 26% say it's a very good or a good choice. Conversely, boys, only 14% say it's a bad choice and almost 80%, 77%, say it's good or very good. When we ask girls why, they don't go into the computer, why they think it's a bad choice for them, they say things like, it's boring, maybe only nerds go into computer science, my mentors and my parents are not telling me to go into computer science, and certainly there's an element of self-confidence and fear that plays a part as well. There is no question that high skills are the gateway to the middle class. Low skills will continue to be replaced by machines and robots. There are 22,000 computer science jobs open today in the state of Florida, 67,000 in California. Just those two states, almost 100,000 computer science jobs open as we speak. Sadly, only 14 states allow computer science to count for a math or science for your graduation. I'm proud to say that Florida is one of those states, but the other states need to move forward. And we need to do a better job teaching computer skills. When we talk to parents, 90% of the parents say that they want their children to learn computer science. But we teach computer science in only one in four schools in America. Only 18% of the high schools in Florida actually offer a computer science class. Last year, there were 50,000 students across America that took the AP computer science exam. Only 25% of those were female. Only 13% were people of color. And in 2013, there were actually three states where not one female took this exam. And last year, there were 10 states where not one person of color took this exam. Now, this also has a huge business and economic impact. Deloitte just came out with a, a research paper, and they've indicated that in this recent study that low technology skills are actually costing our economy $1.7 trillion every year. The reason, only one in three are proficient in their work tech tools. Only one in 10 have actually mastered their work technology tools. Low productivity. And I think we all know that productivity gains is important to wage growth. 58% 
of all the new employees coming to the workforce were rated as low in using technology to solve problems. So, about a year and a half ago, we decided to act again and form a STEM hub here in Northeast Florida. Science, technology, engineering, math, and we added medical as well. These were the corporations in America that have come together. We have a 15-member corporate board that are overseeing our initiatives to work with our education institutions to make sure that we have a 21st century workforce ready for the jobs of the future. We started with the idea of increasing access. So we formed a partnership with an organization called Code.org, which is a nonprofit out of Seattle that has a K through 12 curriculum in coding. They actually give it to the district for free. And they work to help you train teachers and pay professional development fees so that we can teach coding in our schools. They start teaching coding in kindergarten in China. So right now, they are working with FSCJ, and we have trained over 300 teachers in Northeast Florida and moving forward with teaching coding in elementary schools, in school, in the curriculum. The other thing we did to increase access was to work with the first Lego League robotics. We had a partnership with Renaissance Jacks to expand the number of after-school and out-of-school robotics clubs. Now, the research basically says that if you go through the first LEGO League robotics program, you're seven times more likely to become an engineer. Renaissance Jacks this past year increased the number of after-school and out-of-school clubs across Northeast Florida by 62%. We now have over 200 clubs in Northeast Florida. Now, why did this happen? One, we had a great leader at Renaissance Jacks, Mark McComb. I met Mark a little over a year ago, and I asked him, how do we work on a public-private partnership? How can the STEM hub help? How, what, is your, what are the barriers to growing this? And he said, you know, the districts aren't paying professional development for teachers to learn how to teach robotics, and they don't pay a stipend to be a coach. So it seemed to me a little silly that we're willing to pay a middle school basketball coach $1,200 for a stipend to coach, but we don't pay a teacher that's willing to coach a robotics team. So our idea was that the STEM hub would come together. Agree. <laughs> the STEM hub would come together, and we would buy the supplies. The supplies are expensive, so we raised about $150,000. And we went to the districts and said, okay, here's the deal. We'll buy the supplies, we'll give them to you on one condition. You start paying professional development and you start paying a stipend. And you know what? They did it. And that's how we grew 62%. Mark actually had the, the president of First Lego League Robotics come to Jacksonville to celebrate the fact that we were number one in the country. So why is this access important? We need to make sure we broaden opportunities for students to bump into STEM fields and to bump into computer science. Take Cameron. Cameron was a typical girl in Nassau County in high school. She was a cheerleader. She wanted to join a robotics team. Well, guess what? Her high school didn't have a robotics team. But she knew that a high school 30 minutes away had one. She was assertive enough to go over there and actually work her way on that team. I asked her how she did it. She said, I begged. And it worked. And I said, was it mostly boys? And she said, yeah. I said, well, how did they feel about you coming and join the team? She said, well, they felt pretty good about it until I took one of their jobs. <laughs> so anyway, she became the lead programmer for the Java language. Actually, one of the best in the league. She applied for and won a presidential scholarship, an $80,000 full ride paid for to Florida Polytechnic University. 
but she's studying computer engineering. And incidentally, I asked her, what's the demographics look like? And she said it's 86% male. And that's not unusual for our uh, polytechnic universities. Studying computer science and working on machine learning. Cameron took the initiative. She was unreasonable. And she's clearly paving a path for herself to live the American dream. And then there's Brandon Mack. Brandon moved to Jacksonville. He was a football player. Decided to change gears. Got an internship at Johnson & Johnson. Also joined the first tech challenge building ro robots. Very successful at it. He applied for a Bill and Melinda Gates scholarship. He got a full ride. He's now at the University of North Florida. And Bill and Melinda Gates have agreed to pay for not only his undergraduate, but all the way through his doctorate. <laughs> Plus, one year studying abroad. Brandon is now on, involved in three different robotics teams. He's specializing in artificial intelligence. Brandon is unreasonable. He pushed himself beyond his comfort zone. And he's on, well on his way to living the American dream. And then last is my niece, Melissa Gardner. Now, Melissa's a little bit older. She's 38 years old, and a few months ago, I was talking to her, and I said, Melissa, you know, only 2% of females are in computer science. What turns you on to go into this field? And she said, you know what it was? When I was in middle school, my math teacher told me I was good at math. I said, I didn't really think I was good at math, but that gave me confidence, and I started taking more advanced math classes. And that's where my love of STEM was born. She applied to and got into Worcester Polytechnic Institute where she got her bachelor's degree. She got her master's from Southern New Hampshire University and currently she's the director of investment technology at Fidelity Investments in Boston. Melissa is living the American dream. So, what needs to be done? In my opinion, what we did here in Northeast Florida needs to be done in every city in America. Have the corporations come together and form a nonprofit work with our educational institutions, and expand access to computer science, coding, and robotics. And we need to make sure that our technology infrastructure is right, is that's in our schools, and it's actually in our homes. We need a lot of parent education as well, and encourage digital literacy. We need to get involved in the legislative process as well. The governor of Arkansas, one of the platforms he ran on was that if he won, he would put computer science at every high school in Arkansas. He won. They passed a bill. He signed it into law. Today, Arkansas, mandatory computer science has to be taught in every high school in the state. So if we embrace this idea that computer science has become a new form of currency, then we will help thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people increase their economic well-being and climb that economic ladder and live the American dream. And maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to fill those one million jobs in 2020. Thank you.